Good morning, Church Online. Hey, guys, we're so glad you could be here. Whether you're watching this at our very first 9 a.m. service or 11 o'clock, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter where. Hey, it could be Wednesday. We're glad that you're here, that you join with us. One thing that we love to do, though, if you are watching live, we want to hear from you. So right now, in the comments, just literally, just say, I'm happy to be here. That's all we're asking. I'm happy to be here. And if that's too much, if you're someone, you've been watching church online, you've been joining us, but you've been a little too nervous to comment, hey, just throw a wave emoji. We'd love to see who's here. We're so pumped this morning. We're beginning a brand new series called Church Has Left the Building. Now, whether church has left the building or not, one thing remains constant. We love reading the word of God. So this morning, if you guys have a Bible, if you want to follow along, it's going to be on the screen. We're in Luke chapter 18. It says this, starting in verse 9, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself when he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that the man that this man, rather than the the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. As we begin, I want to give our message a title this morning, and shout out to Marin Morris and Zed. I want to call our message this morning, Why Don't You Just Meet Me in the Middle? Now, for those of you guys, our faithful podcast listeners, you won't be able to see this, but for everyone who's watching online right now, church online, you will see that I'm in the great outdoors, and you may be asking yourself, why are you out there? Uh, There's probably wind and other elements, like, isn't it easier inside? One of the reasons that we're outside is that we're starting a brand new series, like I just said, it's called Church Has Left the building. Church has left the building, and we're just so excited for this. Now, I know for a lot of people, you're asking yourself, like, wait a second, like, church left the building, like, 10 weeks ago. It took you 10 weeks to come up with that title. Like, is that all you do with your life? And to that, I say, uh, no. But uh, I'm just excited for this series, and the reason being, and the reason I want to do this series right now is not because I'm oblivious to the fact that church left the building a long time ago, um, but I want to do this series right now because, and depending where you are, it's going to look a little bit different, but for us here in Alberta, um, restrictions are slowly lifting, right? Like you guys, if you guys have been around um, for a while, you've seen like stores are opening up. You're kind of allowed to do more things. And so um, as things are slowly restricting, I'm sure, I'm sure for a lot of us, we kind of have this excitement. I know I have this excitement, like things that I want to get back to. Like I'm super excited. And I don't know if you guys have found yourself doing this kind of longing for like the past. Like one thing that I've been doing, uh, just some days when I kind of feel low and I just wish things were what they were. I'll go onto YouTube and I'll watch old sermons of myself, like just the very beginning when the whole crowd is standing up and uh, just imagining that I'm in that moment again with everyone. And y'all can judge me, but I'm sure you guys do weird things longing for the past. Some of you guys, like I can't wait to go through airport security again. I don't know what you're hoping for, but I think for a lot of us, there's this idea that like, man, I can't, get, I can't wait for things to get back to the way that they were. And with the way that Alberta is going, it's kind of hopefully slowly in the near future, things are going to go back um, at least in some way to what they were. But one of the reasons that I want to do this series, and one of the reasons I want to do this series right now is when restrictions are sort of lifting, is that I have a hope, and it's this. My hope is that church never comes back to a building. Now, for a lot of us, you might be looking at me kind of funny, looking at me sideways, and uh, I want you to look at me that way, and I said that uh, statement on purpose, but there's a reason for it. You see, one thing that I believe to be true is that we serve the God of the turnaround. What that means is this. I believe that God wants to take what the enemy meant for evil and he wants to turn it for good. I believe that God wants to do things in situations where we may feel like we don't necessarily want to be in them. I just believe that God has a purpose and a plan in every single season of our lives. 
And so I just think that in this time of quarantine, this time when things maybe aren't the way that we wanted them to be, I just began to wonder if perhaps this time, this season was a time where God wanted us to begin to recalibrate. Now, for a lot of us, maybe that recalibration was with our families. Maybe that recalibration was with with work. But one thing that I think all of us can take from this time is I believe that God wanted to recalibrate our idea of what church is. Now, what I mean by that is this. Number one, and it's super simple, I hope we never again take for granted the privilege that we had when we were together. It's often not until we lose something that we know how important it was. But, but even more than that, I think what God wants to do in this season and what God wanted to do in this season is that God wanted to recalibrate our idea of what church is. You see, one thing that I say, and I believe it to be true, church has never been a place I go nor an event that I attend. But what we say all the time is this, if I'm a follower of Jesus, if I believe in Jesus, I am the church. And so what that means and what I believe is that where, the ch- where I go, the church is. Because if I'm the church, where I go, the church is. And some people have said, man, churches have been closed. Church could never be closed because church isn't a place, it's a people. And so my hope in this season was that God had begun to recalibrate our idea of what church is. Because for so many of us, I think things have shifted in our lives, in our culture, where church is not a people, church is not a person, church is a building, church is a place that I go or an event that I attend. And so when I say I hope church never goes back to being a building, what I'm saying is as things move towards some, somewhat of a normalcy, I hope that church never goes back to normal. I hope that church leaves the building forever. And my prayer and my belief is that if you are the church, what I want to do in this series that we're calling Church Has Left the Building is I want each and every one of us to begin to learn how to be the church. What does that actually look like, practically speaking? Because I believe that if we can begin to actually be the church, the church will explode. I believe the name of Jesus will be proclaimed everywhere, in our, in our workplaces, in our, in our schools, wherever it is. We just have to learn how to be the church. Now, for a lot of us, I know we have this innate fear. And for myself, even as a pastor, I have this fear. It's like, well, I want to be the church. I want to share Jesus, but there, there's just fear. There's fears of rejection. There's fears of other people's perception. And so I think what happens for a lot of us is that what happens with church is that faith And God, faith becomes something we do as opposed to who we actually are. You're the church and I'm the church. And in this series, we're going to grasp what that really means and how to actually do that. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 18. And I just believe that if we can put this into practice, we will begin to see lives changed. Because the beauty of Jesus is this. Number one, Jesus never had a building. Jesus never needed a building. Wherever Jesus went, people flocked. The irreligious, the religious, the sinner, the saint, everyone flocked to Jesus. And the beauty of being one of his followers is that if we can follow his message, I believe that we can live in the same way that made Jesus irresistible. And so what I want to do is I want to dissect the words in the parable that we just read in Luke chapter 18. Now, for those, if you're new to the Bible, the book of Luke is found in the New Testament. What the New Testament is, is all about the life of Jesus and and the church that followed. And so Luke specifically is a book written by a doctor named, you guessed it, Luke. And so Luke documenting the life of Jesus. He tells a time when Jesus told a parable. And so this is what it says in verse 9 once again. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. I need us to see that. To those who were confident in themselves and looked down on everyone else. That's the context of who Jesus is writing uh, and telling this parable to. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, for the audience in which Jesus was speaking, as soon as Jesus brings in these two characters, the audience would have known exactly what he was trying to do. But for those of us, maybe we're not familiar with what this is and what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is doing is Jesus is presenting us two sides of a different spectrum. 
On one side of the spectrum over here, we have the tax collector. Now, if you know anything about this time, a tax collector was seen as someone that was despised. A tax collector was, was lowly. A tax collector was seen as a traitor. That's one half of the spectrum. Then on the other end of the spectrum over here, we have the Pharisee. Now, what the Pharisee was, the Pharisee was a pious person. The Pharisee was a religious leader. The Pharisee was known because they had literally memorized the Old Testament, the Torah. And so what happens is Jesus presents a picture with two opposite ends of the spectrum. Tax collector, Pharisee. Everyone following? And so verse 11 says this. It says, the Pharisee stood up by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. Now, it's funny because the essence of what this man is saying, this religious leader, he, he's basically saying this. He, he's saying, you know what? I may not be perfect, I may not have it all together, but you know what? I'm just happy that I'm not like those other people over there. I'm not like the robber. I'm not like the evil doer. I'm not like the tax collector. I'm just happy that I'm not like them. You see, what he was doing is that he was making a distinction. And that distinction was this. I'm over here and those other people are over there. Now, whether we know this or not, each and every one of us in our minds, we make that distinction. We have a distinction. We classify people, right? It's like, I'm, I'm a Christian or, or a non-Christian. I'm, I'm left-wing or I'm right-wing. I'm conservative, I'm liberal. You see, we as people, in the same way this Pharisee thinks, we do the same thing. We think in terms of absolutes. We think in terms of spectrums. Well, where do I fall on the spectrum? Am I a good person or am I a bad person? Now, what we saw at the beginning of the parable, Jesus said, I am, he's writing, he's, he, he's saying this parable to those who think highly of themselves and look down on other people. You want to know what he's saying? The essence of what Jesus is saying, he's saying this parable is for all those who want to make distinctions. Why is this important? This is important because the kingdom of God does not have distinctions. In fact, the kingdom of God, the thing that Jesus was ushering, was meant to break down distinctions. It was make, meant to break down barriers. That's what Galatians 3 is saying. There is no longer slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ. That's what Romans 3 is saying. We've all fallen short. You see, what the kingdom of God is doing is it's breaking down distinctions. And what Jesus wants to do in our lives and what Jesus is trying to do in this parable, Jesus is trying to get us to start to think in terms, not what makes us different, not in terms of distinctions, but in terms of what unites us. And what unites us is Jesus. Now, what we're talking about in this message, what we're talking about in this series is how can we begin to take church outside of the building? How can I live a life where I actually reflect Jesus? One of the ways that I believe that we need to begin to act and live like Jesus is that we need to stop thinking in terms of what divides us and start thinking in terms of what unites us. You see, what happens is we have this mentality you guys know what I'm saying? The mentality that says, guess what? You know what? And this is what the Pharisees saying too. It's like, I may not be perfect. I may not have everything together, but I can find someone that I'm better than. And, and I think more than ever, we live in this world full of distinctions where we're forced to pick a side. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's like, I either believe in this over here or I believe in this over here. And what happens when we live on these spectrums, when we live on these sides, one side is right, and whatever side we are not on is, is wrong. If I'm left, then the right is wrong. If I'm right, then the left is wrong. And so what happens is these two sides begin to see each other as the enemy. Now, for a lot of you guys are saying, Harrison, what, what, are you saying to your, what are you saying to us right now? What are you trying to get across? What I'm trying to get across is this, and this is a very simple message. We will never be able to reach people that we think we are better than. Come on, somebody, write that down. We will never be able to reach people that we believe that we are better than. And I need us to understand, it's not just with one issue. 
Because it's like, okay, he's talking about Christians and non-Christians. As Christians, we can't think we're better than non-Christians. No, 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 no. It goes so much farther than that. Because like I said, we live in a world that makes distinguishes, distinguishes between everything. It's like, well, well, you know what? Like, if you wear a mask or if you don't wear a mask, we're enemies, right? Because only the bad people either wear it or they don't wear it. It's like, well, 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 well either I'm, I'm a feminist or I'm a misogynist, and there, there's no in-between, and we can't. And so what happens is everything in life becomes distinguished. And there's nothing wrong, understand this, with having opposing views and opposing points of, of, of life, of, view, of views on life. But what happens is the world that we live in, it causes us more often than not to pick a side and it villainizes those who are on a different side than we are. And so the question that I want to ask is this, how can we reach people? How can we reach a world when we think that we're better than other people? It's like this. I was talking to my friend recently. We had a conversation, one of my best friends, and uh, we were talking about the coronavirus. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that virus. It's kind of a big deal in most places, uh, but we had this conversation about it, and uh, this was a, a few weeks ago in the United States, and um, people were protesting everywhere. I don't know if you guys saw that, um, big protests, and uh, we were just talking, and he said, you know what? When I see these protesters, it makes me so angry. And, and it makes me so angry because these people are protesting to get haircuts. And what they don't understand is that my family all works in the healthcare industry. And my family is literally coming face to face with coronavirus every single day. And so when I see these people protesting, it makes me so angry. And I just can't stand these people. And I just cannot stand these people and their privilege. And, and we were having this conversation, and this conversation I'm just using as an example because I want you to think right now in your life because no matter who you are, we all have had situations like this where we see someone, we see people doing things, and we don't agree with what they're doing. I'm not sure if you guys remember the protesters on the bridge in Edmonton uh, a number of months ago. That was me in that time. I was like, I don't get these people. Get off the bridge. But he said, I don't understand these protesters. I can't handle their privilege. And they have privilege because they're healthy. And so for them to protest, it's just, it's wrong. It's wrong. And for a lot of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, one of the reasons that we will get so down on other people, one of the reasons it's easy for us to pile on other people, whether it's with protesters, whether it's with people with different views than us, is that when we look down on people, we can then begin to feel better about ourselves. We can then begin to feel, you know what, if I'm, uh, at least I'm up here. These guys are here, I'm up here. Well, I'm better than them. I thank you, God, that I'm not where they are. The question is this, what do we do? Because you're saying to yourself, Harrison, you're asking me not to look down on people. Well, what do I do if I know they're wrong? Come on, you guys been there at situation. It's like, I know they're wrong. What are you asking me to do? It is super simple. What if instead of always asking the question, what are those people doing? How could those people go out there? How could they do all of these things? What if instead of asking how, we began to ask why? We began to ask why. You see, what I said to my friend, I said, you know what? Uh, What are you really angry about? He said, I'm angry that these people are out there protesting um, the fact that they can't get haircuts. Like, give me haircuts or or give me death. And so what I I said to him, I said, have you ever asked yourself why? And I want you to dig deeper because maybe there are some people out there that just want haircuts. But I want you to dig a little bit deeper. Have you ever really, really asked yourself, why would people go out there and protest? And what I said to him, I said, have you ever thought to yourself, maybe one of the people out there that is protesting is a small business owner. And he has a fear that that if this lockdown doesn't end, his business is going to shut down. What if the reason he's out there, can I tell you guys something? One of the biggest things that causes people to do things that we may not agree with is fear. It comes back to fear. I'm I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but in the United States, the National School Lunch Program feeds 30 million kids a day. 30 million children a day. And so I asked them, I said, have you ever thought that maybe some of the people protesting were parents that were scared that if schools don't don't open back up, they don't know where their next meal is coming from? 
Now, I want you to understand something. I'm not really forming an opinion one way or another. What I'm showing us is that in life, if we want to begin to see things instead of spectrums, instead of different sides, we have to begin to ask ourselves and ask the question, why? Why are people doing this? Why are people acting in such way? Because you see, we as, as a society have this tendency to form an opinion. And then when we form our opinions, when we say something, we feel like we have to stand on it. We have to say, if I'm over here, I have to stay over here. Or if I'm over here, I have to stay over here and I can't waver. And what happens then is that the two sides become enemies. But one thing that I believe that Jesus is calling us to do, one of the things I believe that Jesus calls the church to do, Jesus calls us to be in the middle. You see, we live in this life of spectrums. Jesus calls us to be in the middle. And I believe that Jesus lived a life where he was in the middle. Now, I need you to understand something. The middle is not a belief system. The middle is not to believe that both sides are wrong. The middle is a way and the middle is a place where we are able to meet people no matter what the other person believes. We are able to say, you know what? I may not agree with you, but I'm going to meet you in the middle. You see what the middle is? The middle is a, is, is a way where we seek first to understand instead of being understood. You want to know the beauty of Jesus? Because some of us are saying, are, you're telling me that I have to treat people with love, respect, and dignity even if they're wrong? Absolutely. Jesus was in the middle. And what that meant for him was that Jesus hung out with people that were dead wrong in their lifestyle, in their behavior, in their beliefs. Yet Jesus met them in the middle. Jesus loved them despite their differences. Jesus served them. You know, one thing with the Bible that's interesting, we always like talk about how Jesus went down on religious people and he was down on religiosity and he was. But one thing that we see with Jesus, because we always talk about one end, right? Jesus hung out with the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes, which is true. But if you read the Bible, what you will notice is that for as many times as there are sinners and tax collectors, there's also Pharisees and religious leaders. What that means is that Jesus had a way to hang out with both spectrums because he was in the middle. And it didn't matter if people thought differently than him. It didn't matter even if they were acting wrong. Jesus met them in the middle. Now, for some of us, we're saying, you know what, what about injustice? Because there's things I, I need to stand up against because it's wrong. Understand this, I'm not, agree, I'm not disagreeing with you. As a church, I believe it is our job to be champions for justice. It is our job to lead the way, to, to break oppression, to, to bring forth freedom. But I want you to understand something because this is what the middle looks like. The middle says just because someone is doing something wrong, that does not stop me from seeking to understand. That does not stop me from asking why? What if we just said to ourselves, I'm going to try and understand you instead of trying to put myself above you. I'm going to seek first to understand instead of putting myself up here. Look what, the, look what happens in the parable that Jesus tells. We have the Pharisee and now we have the tax collector. It says the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He was unrighteous. That's what he's saying. He said, God, have mercy on me. The thing was, he knew it. He, he was a sinner, but he understood his condition. Can I tell you guys something? I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier. One of the beauties of the kingdom of God is that because of Jesus, we're on the same playing field. You know what that means? The Bible tells us that all have fallen short. The Bible tells us we're all messed up. We're all sinners. None of us are good enough. You see, this is one of the dangers of religion. Because what religion says is what I have is because of what I have done. Because of, of my actions, I have favor from God. Because I go to church, because I tithe, because I don't swear, because I don't, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, because of me, 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 I'm good. Th that's what religion says. 
Now, I need you to understand something. One of the most ironic things about our society as we push towards a secular society is that we actually are in a society that although it is secular, it's more religious than it knows. What do I mean by that? For our society that is without God, it's all about what you do. Well, if, if you want to have a voice, you need, it is, it's how much I stand up. It's how much noise I make. And so what happens is I am good because of what I do. I have value because I stand in my position and I make noise and I will not leave from there. And everyone that opposes me is wrong. It's me. It's, it's what I do. That's what religion says. But what Jesus came to do and what Jesus is doing, Jesus is doing the exact opposite. And that's what the gospel is. The gospel says that you will never be good enough. You could never be good enough. There is nothing that you can do to attain salvation. There's nothing that you can do to to, to make yourself better in the eyes of God. We were all lost. We were all sinners, but Jesus. Some will say, but God. In the comments, someone just shout, but God. But God, while we were still sinners, because of his mercy and because of his grace, he sent Jesus Christ to die for each and every one of us. Listen to this. The only reason I am who I am, the only reason I am where I am is because of the son of man. It's not because of what I've done. It's not because of my goodness. It's not because of my works. It's because of Jesus. And if we don't understand this, if we don't live by this principle, we will never be able to reach other people because we will live with this belief that says, I'm up here and other people are down here. If I think that I had anything to do with where I am right now, if I think that it's because of who I am that makes me good, I'm gonna have the belief that I'm better than other people. It's like this, I got a text message um, last week, I think, and from a friend, and he had just listened to the last series, and, and he texted me, he said, hey, Harrison, thank you so much for the message. Um, he said, I especially love the part of the sermon where you said that God does not bless us to raise our standard of living. God blesses us to raise our standard of giving. Now, what you need to understand, number one, if that message and that quote spoke to you, act on it. But what you need to understand is as amazing as that quote was, I didn't come up with it. I read that quote in a book by a man and a pastor named Mark Batterson, and it's amazing, and it spoke to me, and I just love it. And so what happened when I texted him back, I texted him back, and I said, hey, I said, thanks, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, This is the person that said that quote. It wasn't me, but it's powerful. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, I took credit for what someone else had written. And uh, one day, like, uh, he, he's reading the book or he's watching stuff online, and the guy that texted me says, hey, wait a second, Harrison didn't come up with this at all. Like, this was someone else. He's a fraud. Like, there was nothing. Like, just imagine for a moment how foolish I would come across, how silly I would look. Why would I look silly? Because I would be taking credit for something that I did not do, something that I could not come up, come up with myself. Now, I need you to understand this, and I need you to see where I'm going. Whenever we come, whenever we bury our feet in the sand and we say, I'm better than other people, I'm better than people that think differently than me, look differently than me, what we fail to realize is we are taking credit where credit is not due. The only reason we are where we are, the only reason we're justified, righteous, and redeemed is because of Jesus. There's nothing I did to earn this identity. I want you to write this one down because if we don't understand this, we will not be able to take church outside of the building. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. And in the spirit of what I'm talking about, that's from Timothy Keller, not from me. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. You want to know what that means? There's nothing that I did to to attain the position that I'm in. What's my position? I'm a son of God. You're you're a daughter of you're a daughter of the king. And so when we understand everything that we have is a gift from God, it should put everyone on the same playing field. I'm not above you. I'm right here eye to eye. And the reason I'm here with you eye to eye is because where I am, how I live, it's all because of Jesus. 
Listen to this for a second, church. The reason that we are able to meet others in the middle is because that's exactly where Jesus met you. Jesus met you in the middle. You want to know what that means? That means that when Jesus met you, man, you didn't look so good. Can I remind you that? When Jesus met you, you didn't have everything all together. You didn't have all your ducks in line. Jesus met you in your sin. Jesus met you in your shame. Yet Jesus treated you with the same love and respect. It's not because of who you are. It's because of who he is. And so what that means, listen to this church. The reason I meet people in the middle is because Jesus first met me there. The reason that I can, I can show grace, I can show mercy, I don't have to agree on everything is because of Jesus. And I just believe this in my spirit. If we can begin to live in the freedom of Christ, that I am where I am because of the Son of Man, it will change every single relationship in our lives. Now, as we close, I want to make this appeal. And it's twofold. For some of us, man, you've never heard of this Jesus. You've never heard of this grace. You've never heard of this gospel. You didn't know that you had a savior. I want to give you the opportunity right now to accept Jesus as your Lord and savior. And in the very same breath, for a lot of us, maybe we had the wrong picture of Jesus. And that wrong picture of Jesus has elevated us because we thought that God accepted us based on what we did. This morning, whatever side of the spectrum you fall on, I want to give you the chance to respond to Jesus. And so it's super simple. I'm in the wild making this appeal. But if you want to give your life to Jesus, wherever you're watching this, in your basement, in your car, if you're listening, if you're running, just close your eyes, everyone, wherever you are. And all you have to do is just pray this prayer. Just repeat it with me. Just say, dear God, I need you. I need you now more than ever. I give you my everything. I give you my wins and I give you my sins. God, today, make me a new creation. Amen. Hey, why don't we all pray together? God, thank you so much for this message. And I pray, God, that it can penetrate our hearts and we can begin to meet people in the middle and church can leave the building forever. We love you, God. We pray in your name. Amen. We really hope that you were blessed by the service today, and we're so glad that you were able to join us. And hey, if you prayed that prayer, we more than ever want you to fill out one of the Connect cards that we have in the description box. Um, we want to be in touch with you. We want to have you as part of our community. And so please fill one out, um, and uh, someone from our team will be in touch with you shortly. Church has officially left the building, but the work does not stop, the ministry does not stop, and you are now the church outside of our four walls. So if you would like to partner with us financially, we encourage you to give online. There are multiple options. Through your generosity, we're able to continue our ministry, we're able to reach the one um, and just make a difference in our community. So thank you guys so much for joining us this week, and we look forward to having you next week. Be blessed. <laughs>